The International 3D Society hosted their first 3D University educational seminar at the Main Theater on the lot at Disney Studios in Burbank, California. Phil Lelyveld, Program Manager of the Consumer 3D Experience Lab at the University of Southern California's Entertainment Technology Center, kicked off the 3DU curriculum. I covered basic ideas such as what is 3D content, what's happening in the consumer space, what are the health aspects of 3D, where is the market heading, um, a little bit about the legal and social impact of 3D, and basically set the stage for the larger program that we're planning for this fall. In vision science, he covered managing convergence changes on a subject in 3D film, while the viewer's focus point stays static on a screen for an optimal viewing experience. Looking to market projections, the focus was on the emerging home market citing gaming and sports as the main drivers to home adoption of 3D, with active shutter lens and passive polarized technologies dominating the home marketplace. Also covered were the main technologies in use in theaters, Real-D and Master Images passive polarized and Dolby D's color shift technology dominating the U.S. market, and the active shutter expand technology, Real-D and Dolby D splitting the European markets. By 2011, studies indicate 2.5 to 6 million 3D TV sets will be purchased with that number increasing to upwards of 30 million sets by 2013. Other markets where 3D will have an impact include military and medical training and education, where studies indicate a 33% retention rate of new information as opposed to a 10% retention rate for 2D material. Today at uh, 3D University, I was looking at well several techniques, but two of the key ones are multi-rigs, which are we take different stereo settings of different parts of the shot and comp them together, and also blending across the cut, essential for making a smooth movie experience. Phil McNally covered interaxial distances, which create the amount of 3D volume in the subject of a shot. The wider the interaxial separation, or the distance between the lenses, the greater the amount of 3D volume in the subject. He discussed how the zero parallax, or convergence point adjusts where the subjects of the shot appear in relation to the screen. A positive parallax places subjects behind the screen, while a negative parallax places subjects in front of the screen. The viewing experience is impacted by proper lens choice. Wider lenses will stretch out images that appear at the outer ranges of the z-axis, which is the depth of the subjects in the 3D space. As capturing lenses get longer, the subjects in the scene will flatten with less 3D volume and cause eye strain. He covered the use of dynamic stereoscopy, which is the use of multiple rigs to capture different subjects at variable 3D volumes as they move in 3D space. To address edge conflicts, dynamic stereo windows are used by animating the black frame around the scene in order to avoid eye strain. He closed by explaining how depth blending helps transitions between cuts, with depth changes appearing more natural. So today at the 3D University here at Walt Disney Studios, I was talking about uh, the history of stereoscopic live action image capture from the 1950s through the 1980s and to the digital stereoscopic revolution that we're having today. Jason Goodman discussed the advantages of the current beam splitter technology cameras with their smaller size and ability to adjust interaxial separation and the distance to zero parallax on set in conjunction with receiving real-time information from on-set 3D monitors. He explained and demonstrated factors and considerations in camera setup for a good 3D shot including focal length, distance to the subject, and the desired 3D effect and how these are used to set the camera's interaxial and zero parallax settings. Next, he discussed the importance of setting the camera's interaxial separation properly, as this is more difficult to fix in post-production. Finally, he covered ways to alleviate eye strain by using smaller parallax values and creating the 3D effect through camera motion and lighting, thus reducing audience eye strain. The general topic is called auto-stereoscopic displays. That means uh, stereoscopic displays that you can view without eyewear. The two main auto-stereoscopic technologies covered by Lenny Lipton were lenticular, or a lens-based system placed over the viewing screen consisting of multiple vertical lenses that create a stereoscopic image by revealing one of the several vertical images displayed behind each vertical lens. The other technology in the area, raster barrier, uses a series of slits or line grids across the image to create the auto-stereoscopic effect. While both of these technologies that don't require eyewear hold exciting possibilities for the future of 3D, picture resolution, processing speed, and bandwidth all currently limit widespread adoption of these options. 
was asked to address sports, so I talked about live coverage and a little bit of the difference between live coverage and movies. But there's an overriding theme to what I'm doing, which is more than just live coverage, and that's to keep hammering on this issue of quality. What goes to the consumer, whether it's a movie or a broadcast, has got to be of the highest quality right now. We can't afford anything less. Steve Sclair's presentation covered the unique considerations for producing sports broadcasting and live events. Because 3D shots allow the viewer to take in more information, shots are held longer, therefore less cameras are needed. On average, about half as many cameras are needed to cover a live broadcast in 3D as opposed to a 2D broadcast. Managing the depth of field is critical in live sports, as shots cut between different cameras can have the subjects making radical jumps in Z-axis position and creating eye strain. Currently, each camera has an operator assigned to this task, along with interaxial adjustments. This process is anticipated to be automated in the future to help reduce crew costs. Currently, the best results for live sports broadcasts occur by going from wide-angle shots to cover unfolding action, then cutting to low-angle tight shots that create a wow factor. Coverage is handled with beam splitter rigs, being used for close shots with side-by-side -side rigs covering long lens shots with wider interaxial needs. Graphics create a unique challenge. If the graphics are placed on the screen plane, this can create occlusion. Currently, best placement for graphics is at the outermost point of A shot's Z axis to prevent this effect. Quality standards need to be adopted for 3D broadcasts, similar to those that exist in 2D broadcasts, to prevent some of the following concerns unique to 3D broadcasts. Vertical alignment problems, rotational errors, focus mismatches, zoom mismatches, divergence balance and edge violations. The presentation concluded by covering motion artifacting using I to P settings to adjust deinterlacing. I really relish the opportunity to be able to talk about this stuff and share information with people. I think that there's a um, there's a lot of misinformation about how budgeting works for 3D, and really I like to uh, to help enlighten people about how we do it and the steps that we take. John Nicolard covered concerns for budgeting and developing 3D productions. The first things to consider are the rig or camera types to be used and to create workflows based on considerations like location, editing software, and if the project will be digitally file-based, about 90% of the current market, or tape-based. Considerations particular to file-based projects include recycling of the recording devices and creating an original digital negative at the end of each shooting day. Other considerations to be included in the line items for the budget are the need for dailies and in what format, file naming conventions for the media used, color correction, screening room needs, and the number of previews anticipated. Final DI budget items include conforming, VFX inserts, 3D sweetening and titling, and color correction. Final deliverables cover DCPs, data tape archives, separation masters, and duplicating a 2D version. Here at the Walt Disney Studios today, 3D University and the 3D Society kicked off what will be a long-term learning opportunity for our friends at the International Cinematographers Guild, BAFTA, Motion Picture Academy people were here today, Television Academy people, Visual Effects Society groups. We had a great crowd and the learning began on a course that will take 18 weeks this fall, but it was a great day. For more information about upcoming events, contact the International 3D Society at international3dsociety.com.